Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, we really want to thank you for coming today. Um, the Cuyamunga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and supporting the rediscovery of the ancient practice of ecstatic trance postures. It was the insightful work of anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman, our founder of this institute, who found the clues and revived the practice. She searched for the oldest evidence available, which she discovered in the world's collection of prehistory and indigenous art, and decoded these select artifacts as ritual instructions. And as an educational institution, we recognize that to thrive, we gotta take an open approach. So we've been inviting scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. On these Sunday discussions for the last year or so, we've had a full spectrum of topics, including neuroscience, mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archeology, span archaeoastronomy, shamanism, mythology, and much, much more. So please do visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member, and we thank you, the supporting uh, community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamonga Institute. Let's return today to the topic of art, art history, our relationship with art. And as I mentioned, the foundation of this institute was art, the need for expression and the desire to document our life and our experiences. And art's more than the history, the journey in relationship to the creation of art is ever present and constantly evolving. There's a spiritual connection. And as we search for integration of the sacred principles of life, art opens a doorway. Art invites us in so that we might find a deeper relationship within ourselves and bridge between mind and spirit. So Laura, this looks like your studies in art history back in school is gonna come in handy today. <laughs> well, um, the power of art and its universality as a language, um, we've been exploring through these talks and uh, in through our work. And we've mostly focused on the indigenous arts. But here I was thinking, boy, Western art has its own secrets, its own uh, sacred elements. And um, when we were in Friday Harbor visiting my sister Kimberly on her bookshelf is a beautiful volume, Asphalt Renaissance, the Pavement Art and 3D Illusions of Kurt Wenner, who's our guest today. And Paul and I had heard uh, Kurt's talk at the San Juan Island Museum of Art some years ago and met him briefly there and his wife Elizabeth. And uh, here is a story of a young man wending his own way, quitting art school, it wasn't teaching what he wanted to learn, and sitting in the museums of Europe and looking directly at that glorious and magnificent art of the masters and drawing it, studying it, looking at it, imbibing its secrets. And his journey continued. Um, I know I spent half my first year of college in Italy uh, on an art history uh, workshop with 25 other students looking at all the art museums. And I know the seductive power of that art, its majesty, its secrets, its depths of layers calls to you. So here I thought, Wow, what a journey to look at that and learn directly from the masters in that way. And then Kurt innovates further. Canvases everywhere are on the street with a ready audience for feedback, he says in his book. And uh, using so much pastel to do the art, he decides to make it himself, more innovation. And then, because he gets so proficient at perspective, makes it 3D, where it just jumps off the, the pavement and becomes alive. So to hear your call to adventure, to meet it head on, to find your own unique contributions, well, here are life lessons um, that we all want to be inspired by. And so when I reached out to Kurt by email and I said, oh, would you like to join us and uh, be the, the Western perspective for the secrets and the power of art and uh, tell us your story. He said, oh yes, and I have more. There, um, in his 
classical tradition, he says, art is not so much a style as much as a language of form based on a profound knowledge and appreciation of our physical universe. And there are secrets to be had to understand in terms of um, perspective and unity and duality and uh, line and uh, all of that. There are metaphysical secrets in geometry. I'm like, yes, we want to learn that too. Yeah. So Kurt has spoken at the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian Institute, Disney Studios, Warner Brothers Studios, uh, Toyota General Motors, and now we can add Queen Monkey Institute to that <laughs> list. He joins us from a small town near Assisi, Italy, home of St. Francis. Hi, Kurt. Thanks for being here Hi. today. Such a pleasure. Oh, I heard that uh, you studied it. You were near, you were in Assisi, weren't you, when you did your studies? Yes, we, we toured everything uh, uh, from Florence to, yeah. Yeah, to it's uh, about, uh, Rome. Well, it's about 30 minutes away from our house. Yeah, wow. Wow, what a pl well, what a choice of all the countries in Europe to make your home. I'd say Italy yeah. is among the most fascinating and and fun. So well, I came for the art and stayed for the food. <laughs> Good line. So um, love your book. I want to recommend your book to everyone. Such a feast for the eyes, but the story, the life lessons, the the journey that you've made at a young man figuring it out and innovating every step of the way. So, um, and I love the way it's put together. Just so many tracks and uh, fonts and, and uh, images to tell your story. It was just a pleasure to read and to hear your talk and we get to hear it today again. So give us That's an overview of what we'll learn today. Okay, well, I got, probably get right into the talk because I've kind of, I think I've arranged it pretty thoroughly. Um, every time I do one of these, I go over everything I've done before. But this time it was a little harder because I made I, what I think are, for me, very some very uh, fundamental discoveries in terms of the nature of creativity, which is something I spent maybe uh, 40 years pondering and working at. And um, so I would describe my career as, despite what I've done, as also being kind of a, a constant philosophical uh, study in the sense that I've tried to take all of the complexities of Western art. Now, one question I think would be interesting to discuss here is, what if you looked at Western European art through the eyes of an anthropologist? Because we're so close to it and it's so fundamental to the way we think and see. I, I think it's been a long time before anybody has kind of objectively uh, reconsidered what Western figurative your European figurative art is, you know, what is what was it trying to do? What 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 does it entail? And what is its relationship to creativity? And so that's kind of what uh, I'd like to start with. But I think it might be easier if we launch right into the slideshow. Sure. Are you up with that? Sure. Let's let's see your slideshow. Okay. Let's get get into it. Okay. All right. So here's your title page and uh, the geometry of creativity, which is a, a book I'm um, writing. Um, I got oh I don't know about half half of the written material uh, ready. But what I'd like to do is start with the premise, which is how I grew up, which was that I consider nature to be creative and intelligent. Um, it's sometimes a, a debated topic. I think it's rather absurd, but it's sometimes a debated topic as to kind of, there's kind of a Darwinian way to look at nature, which says, well, it's all just stupid stuff that happens by accident. And then what some things survive and some things don't. Um, I don't believe this for a second. So, uh, and I grew up not believing it and I joined most of human history and not uh, imagining that this was the case. When I grew up, I really loved plates like this one, which was from Ernst Haeckel 
called literally in German, uh, Kunstforma de, de Natur, which is uh, art forms of nature, meaning that nature actually does art, and, which is my belief. And part of that was probably um, because I, my father, who was a mathematician and scientist, was not always very happy that I was, wanted to be an artist. So he, he gave me this book when I was a young man, and it had, a, I think, a pretty profound uh, influence on me. Not that I liked any of the conclusions in the book, but the thesis was great, and it set me on my own kind of researches uh, in a certain way. So even probably from the age of 12 or 13, um, when I drew or when I, when I did my artwork, I did both artwork from uh, what one sees. On the left, you can see a seashell just drawn from observation. And in fact, one of the problems with drawing is that we draw both by observation and by, let's say, analysis or construction. So on the right side here, I'm as a young person, um, I am trying to understand the seashell in terms of its structure, its geometry. Uh, so that, that book, of course, inspired me to start thinking that way and working that way. And I think my whole life I've done this. And it set me on a path which was quite different than what uh, the art schools would have had me do. I did go to art school, but I went there already with all of these things. I trained myself in perspective and geometry. Um, and and um, I actually don't even recall reading very many books about it. I think I trained myself almost from scratch in a certain weird way, uh, starting with points and lines and then seeing what inevitably happens when you combine them. But I got very good at it and I got uh, good at airbrush and all these different things. Now, remember, we're back in here in, um, um, 1976. So uh, there was no computers, there were no computer graphics, and everything was done by hand, including designs for spacecraft were drawn by hand, and even the letterings were done with a very strange kind of pantograph called a Leroy lettering set. Now on the left here is a, is a drawing done uh, by NASA, a NASA draftsman uh, during the Apollo mission to show you these were done on vellum. They were done on kind of a starched linen with ruling pens and uh, Leroy lettering sets. Now on the right was a drawing I did um, in my probably second year of art college. And I used all the same instruments that would have been used many, many uh, centuries earlier, as we all did. And that drawing got me, it was done for my physics instructor uh, on a, um, this was the, the drawing on the right was an ion mass spectrograph for a project he was working on to go to Halley's Comet. And of course that project eventually flew probably three decades later. But this drawing, because no one could do it at the laboratory and I was able to do it, that eventually got me my job uh, at the laboratory. So I worked at JPL for, for NASA as an artist and did by hand with airbrush and ruling pens and, and uh, I did uh, drawings and paintings of future space missions. I did that for about uh, three years. And uh, it was, of course, a great experience because it was the end, of course, of the golden age of space travel, I think, where the US, it was such a point of pride for the US to do these missions. And um, it was also the end of artists working for NASA by hand because while I was there, the first, rudimentary uh, computer graphics drawings showed up and they weren't useful yet, nor they, were they useful even when I left NASA, but they eventually did become obviously the way to do these things. Uh, something that I was not able to learn completely by myself was figure drawing. And when I went to art school, I was actually told that I would never be able to draw the human figure. Um, and I shouldn't even try, I should stick with uh, more technical things. So, that obviously uh, pissed me off, as they say. Uh, on the left here are not my drawings. These are drawings which are typical of the drawings that would have been done in an art school when I went to, uh, this was uh, art Royal school design, let's just say. On the right are drawings done by artists not much older uh, in the Renaissance. So my opinion was, well, yes, I'm having trouble drawing, but it's kind of weird that nobody's doing good drawings in this art school, not even the teachers. And so I moved out to the West Coast to Art Center College of Design 
um, where I learned line contour drawing, which was the fan at the time. This is one of my line contour drawings done with a pen without any, uh, without any sketching, just direct projection. Uh, so I got good at that, but that wasn't really what, wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to be able to draw from my imagination. And for that, I had a great instructor, Harry Carmian, who did life drawings and taught life drawing and um, was able to get a sense of form and scu a sculptural sense from the figures, from the poses. He did it very quickly and was a brilliant, brilliant lecturer. So in an arc of maybe two to three years, um, these are my drawings. I was able to do sketches from the figure and I was able to do total drawings and um, no longer was in the position where any instructor would be telling me that I, was, I didn't have any talent or ability for this. But at that point, the problem was that I hadn't answered my question, which was, why were artists of the Renaissance better than we are? Why did they do a better job at the figure? So um, I studied, but one thing I found out was that, or I found out or that what kept coming up was that one resource they had, they didn't have a lot of resources we have, have but they had one resource that it wasn't readily available, which was uh, access to antique classical Greek sculptures. And they learned drawing mostly from these sculptures, not really so much from the model. So their drawings were informed by the experience of drawing from these sculptures. And I felt at a certain point, um, if I really wanted to see what this was, what this sort of mastery was, I had to actually go to Italy, sit in front of the sculptures and draw. That was the only way to understand what that experience was. It's not written in a book. Nobody wrote down, oh, you learned this and this and this. Um, <clears throat> so, so really the art of classical drawing is not described in any text, um, what it means perceptually, what it's about. So I went to Italy and it's, um, sold everything, moved kind of permanently to Italy, sat in front of the sculptures and just drew and absorbed it. And uh, I found there were certain things that you could explain. One was that the figures of Renaissance art had a very, have very bold, simple designs. And so they, these are highly designed figures. They're not, they're not the products of observation so much as they are the products of design. And that's a very, very important message. The second thing, um, well, there's other things too. There's the, the, the use of light and there's the um, <clears throat> a consistent language of description. So what I'd like to do here is go over uh, the process of doing a classical drawing because I think it's, uh, it's still not the easiest thing in the world to describe. Uh, there's Michelangelo's famous Adam, which was done, of course, from the drawing you just saw. And um, so you can see really from his drawing where he's really studying things from observation somewhat, he formalizes it, and then he comes up with his final design of Adam. Um, so again, you have this, this design. It's very, very bold design made up of straight lines and circle arcs. And the nature of the design is that straight, straight lines, straight shapes are contrasted with curved shapes. And, they're, and what are, what, what's the arbiter of, of what happens when a straight line goes to a curved line is proportion. That, that when a, a line goes from being straight to curved or curved from straight, the next segment is either longer significantly or shorter than the last segment. So that gives you, and, and so, so the, the form itself or the, the physical form is interpreted in terms of shapes which are or obviously curved or obviously straight. So once you have this particular framework drawn even very, very lightly on a piece of paper, you can continue your drawing and here I have a little bit of a segment where I've got a time lapse of a drawing. And what I'd like to do is just talk about the experience while I play this. So what you can see is that once you have this very, very loose, this not loose framework, but a very simple framework, that the process of drawing is extremely fluid. That is, I'm not sitting there making a bunch of decisions. I'm not even thinking about it. 
it comes together in a way uh, having to do with the muscle memory of my hand, which I've learned by doing a number of drawings, not from life, but from artwork and from sculptures. So the language I'm using has been internalized. I've internalized the language, which has been learned from works of art. And this language allows me to look at nature. And even if I am observing something, I am not going to be merely copying what I see. I'm going to be interpreting it in a particular language of light and dark, where, whereby I'm going from long to short, curve to straight. And I'm balancing all of these different contrasts in a, in a way that would be very much like musical composition. So the, the problem is with the drawing is that this process is internalized. That is to say, um, it's muscle memory. So it can't really be, it, it can be, you know, the temptation in the past was to say, okay, as a young artist or a young would-be artist or a student, you just sit in front of the, of the sculptures and you draw. That's how you learn. And there wasn't really an intellectual approach to the whole thing. Now this worked great for about three or 400 years, but then when photography came in, um, the, the vision, people's vision became kind of uh, polluted, let's say, with photographic images. Now photographs can be great art, but they can also be accidental, which means that we end up with a lot of graphic images, which are not clear, concise designs. They're arbitrary. Hmm. So uh, this particular kind of drawing with the invention of photography became more difficult to do. And in fact, uh, the academies, it was harder and harder for the academies to, to teach it. It took longer and longer. And pretty soon artists just became fed up. And there's, we get kind of modernism as a reaction to the fact that artists are just plain fed up with the whole thing. So here again is a, is a three stages. You've got the simple geometrical graphical design the softening of that design using the same process, but with greater subtlety. But it must, it must be emphasized. Uh, oftentimes these things are taught as techniques. They're not techniques. They are, it's a language of design. And the point of the drawing is to hold the design all the way through to the finish. So you don't lose the, as, as you render out all the different muscles and so forth, you don't lose the design. And it's a trick. But it allows you then, it allows you to enter into this language, this historical language, which we often call classical drawing, and to um, draw from, this is from a sculpture. Uh, these are also from sculptures. I made my money my first six months in Italy. I made my money by drawing from sculptures and selling them off my drawing board to tourists. Uh, this would have cost, these would have cost you 12 bucks in the day. But eventually, having internalized this language, you, it becomes possible to compose. This is an original composition done in the language that I learned uh, from my studies. Now, um, none of this paid me enough to live. So in order to live, I needed to find something else to do. And looking around Rome with, uh, as a young, you know, 21, 22 year old with no knowledge of Italian language and no permit to stay in the country, I had to find something a little bit um, not so official. And so I found, I saw people doing payment art, which is, uh, turns out is a rather old tradition in Europe. Uh, wasn't very well known uh, outside of Italy at the time. So I, I started uh, drawing on the pavement. I came in touch with some of the last of the Italian pavement artists as well, which is kind of interesting experience. And learned to, uh, use the rough surface of the pavement in order to express uh, my artistic ideas or to do copies. So here you see uh, my drawing of Moses done in the, in the church, uh, San Pietro in Vincoli in Rome, and then uh, done on the pavement in color as if it was one of the prophets from the Sistine ceiling. So that was, these were my studies now. Um, this is my own uh, private art school and I'm getting money for it. It was actually, I made, uh, even in my first days of street painting, I made uh, three times my NASA salary. So I was able to get a full on um, 
bohemian lifestyle. I could go where I want. I could uh, eat at restaurants, stay in hotels. It was a very good lifestyle. Uh, probably in some ways better than uh, what I do now. <laughs> Anyhow, so I spent a um, year-ish doing copies of masterpieces and then uh, also doing my own versions of these things. But in the, in the meantime, I continued my studies of geometry. Obviously, I'd become a pretty good at perspective at NASA, uh, good enough to be professional at that. But I was also interested in the uh, history of perspective. So I went to, would go to libraries and archives and get books done hundreds of years ago and look through them and to see how they felt about perspective, what they were, um, what it meant when it got invented. I wanted to go back and feel the, the, the I wanted to have the feeling of discovery with it. Not just I'm going through a book and saying, oh, this is what you do in order to get this effect, blah, blah, blah. So I really was interested in how they studied and it was quite painstaking. Here you can see a, Durer, a famous Durer uh, drawing where uh, he's calculating a lute in perspective by building a, a, a frame, a hollow frame, having a, a, a um, string on a weight which, and then marking every single little point on this loop so that uh, he can do a perspective drawing of it. Now, perspective was hard one because a lot of things happen in perspective that artists didn't like. One of the things was that uh, spheres elongated into ellipses as, the, as they went away from the center point of perspective and that artists could not for the life of them figure out why this happened. Another thing was uh, column, uh, column-based distortions, which meant these circles depicted in perspective. Um, they, you can see on the bottom left and the bottom right particularly, they, they, they appear to tilt, uh, which nobody really liked very much when they were doing perspective drawings. And they couldn't figure out also the axis of the tilt, even if they wanted to depict it this way. It turns out the axis of the tilt is a hyperbola. Well, so it's, and it, there's a rather nice story about it. I don't think we have time to go over it here. But the, um, this was really, this really disturbed artists at the time. The problem with it is that perspective, um, it isn't so much that you look from a certain um, angle, it's that you're supposed to view a piece from a certain exact point. Now here you can see where I'd say 90 degrees in the, in the blue line, the vertical blue line, which says distance. That's how far you're supposed to be to see this perspective drawing. So what happens is that if you're within a 90 degree field of vision, you get a pretty good uh, rendition in perspective. But when you go outside of 90 degrees, the lines receding into the distance, they get longer. So the, 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 the square face of the cube, this is a perfect cube, square face of the cube on the right is no longer acceptable to us. It's no longer a conventional expect, uh, perspective. However, if I were to look at the, that cube from the right point, it turns out um, that's the same cube on the right as the long cube, but using a fisheye lens and, being, and putting the lens at the right point, that cube stays a cube. Also in rectilinear uh, perspective, if I put my camera at the right point, you can see that same cube on the right, I'll go back twice. Those are both this very long cube, but it, um, isn't long as long as you're in the right point. Now this obviously also bummed the artists out a lot. And part of the reason was that the human eye is curved and the human eye has a terrifically wide field of vision. And you can test this yourselves by taking your arms and wiggling your fingers. And if you hold your arms out in front of you, wiggle your fingers, and then move your arms to your sides, staring straight ahead, and pay attention to the point where you still are aware that your fingers are wiggling, you'll find out that you see nearly 180 degrees. So human experience takes place over an extremely wide field of view, uh, which I also studied, but, it, um, but pictorial perspective, that is what you can use in a painting, is much narrower down to 90 degrees. So basically in a painting, um, using traditional conventional perspective, you can only paint half of what you see, what humans experience. Now here's another thing, uh, drawing, which I did myself, I did a number of these, where I do mathematically perfect spheres projected uh, from a center point. And when you're at the center point, the sphere looks spherical. But as it moves away from the center point, 
um, it appears more and more elliptical. That's because we're not at the right distance to, and you can see where the little eyeball is. If I switch that up and that's my distance, or if I put a, a fisheye lens there, uh, you can see that the spheres go back into being spheres. I did this study too. This is a, an amorphic drawing of geometrical shapes, one of the favorite exercises of the ac academies. Again, the um, spheres, as they go toward the edge of the um, picture plane, they distort into ellipses. But if I take the same drawing and give a fisheye view of it, my spheres turn back into circles. Another, here's another exercise where I did a drawing here um, using hyperbola. And then this is a photograph of the drawing on the right in my studio, it's the same drawing. So you can see that if you want something to appear proportional in a fisheye lens for your eye, it's gonna to need to be uh, hyperbolic in the drawing. So using all of that kind of perspective research and my classical drawing, I came up with the 3D pavement art. And this is the result. This painting I, I, I did on site without any uh, preliminary drawings except full size, which is how I used to work in those days. Again, another painting, this was filmed by the National Geographic in their documentary uh, on pavement art on, and 3D pavement art, which was, they documented it in the first year of its life. So as the years have gone on, the painting, my pictures have gotten more and more, um, let's say, uh, complicated and bigger. This is, a, a little, uh, this is done for Greenpeace and it's a, a canvas with a million signatures that you can't see in the photo, but around the edge to protest the GMOs in Europe or the introduction of GMOs without researching their eventual effects on native crops. This one is in, done in uh, Singapore at the Changi Airport. This, this art form has taken me all over the world. It's been very popular, Utah Arts Festival on a Native American theme, Fiji, uh, Taiwan, and uh, Osaka, Japan, with a Superman theme. So the, um, when I was working for NASA and when I was studying perspective, I was able to use these drafting instruments, as I said before, which were the same pretty much as drafting instruments you'd find in old etchings from three or 400 years ago. They didn't really change very much. Uh, we saw a cool compass today earlier. But um, when I went to street painting, chalks and string are unpacked and the work begins. It was very different. There. In four or five days, there will be a street painting. So what I found out, or what it, the street painting or pavement art forced me to understand really what a compass in a straight edge represented. It represents a string, a taut string. And so the earliest geometry, in fact, we use the word bow compass. Well, because the earliest uh, bow compass was probably literally a bow. So this demonstration shows uh, a bow I created myself with a string, taut string. Um, pulling a branch together. Then I can draw along the string and I get a straight line. And I draw, uh, I hold one end of the bow down and hold the, the marker to the string and I can rotate it and get a curved line. So basically our compass and straight edge come down to a taut string. And so the question is really, what does that represent? Now here is a construction, which uh, again, we don't do anymore in geometry class, but if you were in a real geometry class where they were trying to teach you uh, the truth of geometry, you'd do a drawing like this. There's a circle, a straight line crosses a circle, and this gives us two intersections. Drawing from either intersection through the center of the circle, we get another intersection and drawing um, up 
through that intersection, we get a right angle. The other side, we also get a right angle doing the same thing, which gives us two parallel lines. If we join those, we get a rectangle, two sets of parallel lines in a rectangle. Similarly, and more people know this one on the bottom, uh, two circles intersecting and the line through them, you can always get a perpendicular line um, by the intersections of the two circles, even if they're not the same size, and all the way to the point where there's only one point, in which case it's a tangent and you still get a right angle. So the question is why? So the question of why this happens was what Euclid was studying when he came up with his famous elements, which are the basis of geometry, which are in turn the basis of all science. And Euclid approached it by making postulates or axioms, which I always was annoyed at because it's, it felt, I felt that it was rather absurd that we've based all of our science and math on assumptions. And in fact, it's, it, from a philosophical point of view, it's highly problematic. So I spent a quite a lot of time um, meditating on this and I came up with this solution, that there are five um, <clears throat> principles of creativity, I call them. And these five principles of creativity combine with each other to formally describe everything in the universe. And here's how it works. This, if I were to start creating something and I, have, I get myself a piece of paper and I take my marker, let's say, or my stylus, and I put one single point on it. That would be the easiest way to start creating anything. So what do I have? I have the blank sheet of paper and the single point. Now, the blank sheet of paper represents something. It has to symbolize something. What does it symbolize? It symbolizes infinity. It's supposed to go on forever. As, as everyone will tell you who studies geometry. And so it's, it's kind of like the Buddhists would say, the, um, the, the field, you know, the, and, or and the ground of being. It's, 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 it's uh, the basis on which all creation happens. And the point is, 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 as everyone says, completely finite, has no dimension at all. So to, what, I've, what I've stated is you have the principle is unity. Unity meaning everything. Everything has, is going to be within the same uh, reality. And the finite is, is the single, undivisible, selected point, uh, which has been the, is the beginning of your creation. Now, what the second thing I can possibly do um, to create something? The second thing is to put a second point on. Now, when I put a second point on, we get, I think, what's the hardest thing to describe this whole, this whole um, topic, which is duality. Now, duality is not polarity. It's often, these often get confused in uh, kind of metaphysical studies, but duality is different. Duality is that once, when I had only one point in my universe, that point was the center of the universe. Now I've put another point down. Now that point could also be the center of the universe. But they can't both be the center of the universe. So what happens is I have a metaphysical problem here. And the fact of having the two points gives me um, what I can best describe as tension. And this tension is the taut string of the bow. So the line, what it gives me, what it yields again is a line segment, which is the finite expression of duality, which is the relationship between the two points. Um, and then that, that can be extended infinitely. And the infinite extension is, of course, um, that's one of Euclid's axioms. But the important thing here is that the, the line is a description of the direction. So there's, what, what happens is we need to describe the relationship now between the two points. And there's two ways to describe it. One is with the line, which describes the direction of the other point. The next thing we have to des describe is the distance between the two points. So again, now under polarity, you see that the infinite, the infinite uh, description of direction 
which is every possible point in the direction of the two points, of the initial two points. Then the finite is the circle arc, which is every possible expression of the distance between the two points. So what happens is it turns out that the reason that we've based all of math and all of science essentially on the interaction between a circle arc and a straight line is that they're polar opposites. And so the one on the left, the infinite polarity, divides the universe into two, two halves, two reflective halves. The finite divides the universe into an inside and an outside. Now, here's what happens is that when they interact, these two polarities, they're opposites, when they interact, two things can happen. That is, why can we draw, draw that right angle always? Because they're always gonna have a point of equilibrium, a balance. They're opposites, so there always has to be a point where the opposites are balanced. Now, equilibrium too has a finite aspect, which is the right angle, and an infinite aspect, which is the parallel lines. Uh, the finite aspect, of course, they meet at a point, the infinite aspect, they never meet at the point. Now, here's the thing that the line now we've said can really cross a circle at any, at anywhere, and this always works. But depending where the line crosses the circle, there's gonna be more line or more circle. And so there's a relationship there as well, and that's proportion. And proportion, again, on the left side of this, you'll see it has an infinite, an infinite aspect, which is the angle, and a finite aspect, which is the uh, line segment. And they both, these both give us proportion, but they don't do it in the same way uh, because the, the same angle proportion doesn't give you the same side proportion. Only in the case of the square does it happen that way. So all of these, things have, have what I would call attributes. These are the five, the five of them are the creator principles and they have attributes. And these are some of the attributes. I don't know that I've got them all, but you'll see that unity has the attribute of extension, goes on forever, divisibility can do, be divided infinitely, uh, potentiality, everything is going to be created from it. It has also the uh, attribute of affinitude, it can, that is the, it can express itself in an infinitely finite way. It has focus and it's the basis of perspective. So again, duality is relationship, energy, and attraction in the sense that the tense string, the cord of the bow, is, is simultaneously pulling itself together and pulling itself apart. The wood's pulling the string apart, the string's pulling the wood together. And duality is, of course, so, so it has attraction and repulsion. It has relationship, it has ca causality. Repetition in the sense that you've created the point twice. And then polarity has a uh, direction. We said direction, you go to the right, you have uh, distance, which are the two opposite. And then it, it um, creates translation, which is moving along a straight line. Reflection, which is the universe divided in half. It has radiation, which is the uh, right angle. Um, it's the fact is, is that on the left side, it's, we have reflection, which is, is people have studied, obviously it's one of, the, uh, one of these symmetries. Radiation is less apparent because it's often confused with rotation, but radiation is really the um, outward and inward reflection from the circle. So on one side, uh, one's, one half of the universe is reflecting, the other way we get, we get um, um, that, that sim bilateral symmetry. The other way is radial symmetry. Then on equi equilibrium, we have obviously the right angle, the parallel lines, we have per perpendicularity and balance, uh, comparison and equidistance. And then in proportion, we have angle, fractals, and growth on the infinite side, modularity, measurement, and area on the um, static finite side. So that's anyhow my theory of how the universe operates. Now, does it work? Well, anyhow, uh, the problem with the whole thing with coming up with theory like that is I've rewritten Euclid. So we won't go over this, but I basically rewrote um, Euclid's axioms as not axioms, but, um, but basically 
instead of saying Euclid assumed it was possible to draw a straight line from any point to any point. Well, that's some kind of a meaningless statement. So, but if you say a second point of the line connecting the points represent the principle of duality, the line segment represents the attribute of direction between the initial two points. The line is composed of the infinite number of possibilities between the two initial points. Now, so, so if you rewrite Euclid this way, all of a sudden you don't have axioms anymore. You have metaphysical statements. Now, everybody knows, I mean, I think, I think intuitively people understand this, but um, what we don't really, I, as far as I know, it's never been written this way. But for instance, uh, we, we love usually the yin and yang symbol, which is the Eastern symbol of, of duality or polarity, whereas the Western one is actually the squared circle, which is a square and a circle which share the same area. And that's a, it's a kind of conundrum because it's an impossible to create um, <clears throat> relationship using Euclidean geometry. Now, another obvious one is the male and female sign um, with the male being the line jetting out uh, radially from the center and the female sign with the plus meaning that it stays within the uh, circle. That, so the, those are also the polarities um, or dualities of, of our philosophy. So, the, so um, as it goes on, we can see from this list, uh, if we had time, more time, but this list shows attributes of the circle, attributes of yin, they, they pretty much follow perfectly the attributes of the square, attributes of yang. The only difference is, the, is that the earth and heavens are switched in the two philosophies. So Western Europe um, likes the earth to be uh, square and uh, the east is the opposite. Another uh, where we see this, we see the circle and the straight line is in binary computing where we've taken everything and turned it into two symbols. And so binary uh, code also reflects the idea that you have this, uh, this polarity. Now, what happens when these two polarities meet? Lots of things happen. One is a sine curve. And the sine curve is, you can see there's a radial expression of, of the circle. And as the circle moves, as the circle rotates, it also translates. That is, it's going from left to right. At the same time, it's rotating. And that gives us a sine curve. When we think about it, so, so it's really the interaction between a circle and a straight line again. Now, all light, all sound that comes to our senses comes in the form of sine curves. So uh, the, historically, artists and didn't understand or uh, sign curves. It was more of a thing of our time. But they're quite useful in design. And um, I was able to use them to make a color interface based on my experience with making pastels. And the color interface with uh, RGB, red, green, and blue, and CMYK, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, and lab color. Uh, all expressed in terms of, um, of sine, sine waves. And this gives me a perfectly balanced uh, color palette, which is something that nobody has come up with yet, it seems, uh, with 16, uh, 16 colors or eight primaries. I use eight primaries because of the principle of duality and, com and by pu pu putting the complementary colors uh, across from each other. And again, as you said before, I started working with colors in terms of pigment by making my own pastels where I learned the oxides, the earth colors, and the chemistry of, of pigments and color. And then uh, later I was able to, to formalize what I learned from the chemical and the physical qualities of paint and color into the digital qualities. I also studied um, geometry <clears throat> in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, Durer wrote a beautiful long book of geometry for artists, which he described lots of different things. One of the most interesting ones was his description of, of parabola and ellipse. And even though these have rather simple constructions, he, he does them as intersections of circles and straight lines. In this case, concentric circle grid and a straight line grid giving us a parabola. And it turns out all of the curves of art, um, parabola, hyperbola, ellipse, and um, sine curves, 
are all the products of intersections of straight lines and circle arcs. The, with the eventual, um, eventual caveat that uh, proportion makes an entrance in the um, logarithmic, logarithmic curve and the spiral. So all pattern in art and in life evidently is the um, combination of what's classically three, these three um, attributes. It's translation moving along a straight line, rotation moving along a circle, which on this diagram is uh, misrepresented. They're actually showing radiation and reflection. So it turns out any pattern that we could possibly make is a combination of these three attributes. So all of historical design combines these three attributes to make anything. And uh, later on in our time period, we found that there are things called freeze groups and wallpaper groups where mathematicians have decided that there are a, a set of seven uh, different possible freeze groups and only, I think, uh, 17 wallpaper groups, which means all pattern goes into this finite number of different mathematical possibilities, underlying mathematical structures. So I've, I've enjoyed, a, you know, part of my career has been doing decorative arts and pattern. This is a drawing I did for a plaster ceiling and the actual uh, sculpted, hand sculpted plaster ceiling, sculpted and cast. And um, I've also uh, cast, um, this is a plaster work which is uh, of drapery in a bath. So I always have a hands-on thing, but when I do these projects, I'm thinking of them as a proof of concept over, over my uh, rather more philosophical ideas. One thing the ancient world didn't know too much about were fractals, which have become popular in our time period, and tell us a whole lot. These fractals are the proportion, are, are a relationship between growth or proportion, proportion equals growth, and uh, the static or modular designs created by the uh, three symmetries, that is, um, reflection, rotation, and translation. Now the Greeks did have one, one fractal they loved, which was a spiral. And, it, and it's a very educational to study spirals. Spiral, Greek spirals were very sophisticated. And there were lots of different ones. Now it turns out you can take a piece of paper of any angle, and if you fold it at right angles to each side, you get something like this. So that's just taking a paper and folding at right angles from one side, right angle from the other side, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And if you take this angle and you fold it, you get a spiral. Now it turns out I've never seen this done anywhere. So maybe it has been done, but I have not seen this done. And it's, it's a good logarithmic spiral. So basically you can take your angle, divide it from right angles from each side, and then you can um, geometrically, if you want to, you can also make a whole set of pie slices. And if you, if you attach the pie slices from at the circumference of the arc rather than at the center, you get a really, really good smooth logarithmic spiral. Turns out nobody seems to have known this because the actual construction of spirals is extremely kludgy throughout history. And people really, really struggled with it because they were always trying to start their circles from the middle rather than from the edge. Uh -huh. So this, this is what they call volute construction goes and it's probably in thousands and thousands of texts, different volute constructions, and they're all really, really awful. But awful, let's just say they're not mathematically very, uh, they don't have any meaning mathematically. So the problem is that if you can't draw a spiral using an angle simply, what does that mean about your understanding of proportion? Well, it turns out it means a lot because if you study a Greek Ionic capital, you find that on the right, you can see this, this spiral. Now it's not, it's not well drawn in this um, diagram, but you can see that it's a composite of a set of arcs. Now, if you, if you do the set of arcs the way I was saying, which you start with an angle and this and that, you get a set of arcs, like, like the one shown here, and I circumscribed them both with an arc and a square. 
If you take all of those squares, and on the top right, you can see I've taken those squares, made the biggest square the size of the capital, and then taken every single other square once and gone down the list of squares from the biggest to the smallest division, and I get every single division of the capital. Now, isn't that elegant? The question is, why did nobody discover this ever? People spent 500 years trying to understand Greek proportion, and they didn't. They didn't ever figure it out. And it's pretty, I mean, I wouldn't say, I don't know about simple, it's, it's elegant. And um, so, but you can see also when you look at the right, top right hand side, you can see that the biggest squares are the most important divisions. And then the smaller squares, as the divisions get less important, the squares are, they use smaller squares. So the reason I'm pretty sure that nobody's figured this out is because this diagram is shown in hundreds and hundreds of books where this author has created this rather complicated diagram of the Parthenon to show whether one or two points of the facade. Now, you can't really construct the Parthenon from two points, but Religiously, every scholar has published this diagram as if it were God's truth. What, how would you find all of the divisions of the Parthenon? Turns out you can use the one single scale and you get in order of importance, every single division and you don't get any extra leftover lines. Again, one being the whole Parthenon, two being the columns, three being the entire uh, pediment area, four being the discrete part of the pediment, five being the entablature, six being the, you know, and you'll go on and on. It's just all in order, all simple, all inevitable. And it goes down, this is a detail of the Parthenon where you use the same scale down to the finest detail using the same method. Now again, don't try looking for this in an art history book because you won't find it. I made it myself. So did the Greeks, um, did the Romans know this in order to design the Parthenon? Well, I, think, design I, think the I think the Romans didn't know it. I think the Romans had Greek architects and they didn't seem to share. Vitruvius didn't know it, which was the only author, only author existing from all of ancient world who talked about proportion at all. And he obviously didn't understand it. And everybody who's all of the artists or and architects throughout history that just studied Vitruvius uh, got rather disgusted with him after a while and figured that he really just didn't know what the heck he was talking so about. So you're not only decoding the Renaissance masters, you're decoding the Greeks. Yes, I decoded the Greeks and I've rewritten Euclid so far. So it's pretty arrogant, but I don't know from a mathematical point of view, I don't, I see that it's not. I don't know how to argue with it, let's just put it that way. <laughs> uh, musical instruments also, logarithmic curve, and um, I don't know anything about music, so this is, but it is, you can see the frets, so um, I'm not making it up. But you can see an octave here on a ukulele, and you can see how the octave falls um, rather perfectly in a um, <clears throat> sine curve based on uh, the proportion of one to two. Then if you draw over, you can go, you go to the right, these blue uh, rectangles, and those are, um, those are even divisions of the string. So obviously an octave is, is dividing the string in half, and those are all the other divisions of the string, two fifths, one third, and so forth. And those are the Pythagorean um, tunings. And you can see that there's a very tiny difference between the perfect logarithmic um, divisions, which are used today in the ukulele and the Pythagorean in tuning, and that would, I guess, be even temper, although I don't know anything about music. But it seems to me that even temper means that you go to the logarithm, whereas the Pythagorean or the older tuning that Bach um, changed uh, was, was these, these. And there, there's an argument for the Pythagorean because when you have a string and you divide it in half, the sine waves that come out of the sound, uh, they nest in the original proportion. So there is a reason for that as well. Probably also why we have a major and minor keys. 
So I was never, I never published my uh, theory of proportion because I just, it just seemed like too overwhelming to, um, to do it. So instead I just used it in my own architectural designs. So I used, uh, I made my own architectural proportional scale based on, on the um, information that I had and uh, did projects uh, using it. And it turns out that a lot of the projects are the square root of the golden section, which nests within the golden section, which gives you more opportunities. And it gives you quite the uh, perfect, I'm um, perfect. I think it gives you a very gracious classical design. And you can go to an infinite number of divisions and complexities and everything stays uh, harmonious. That's just the nature of the beast. Now, a lot of people think the golden section gets, gets the most funky press of anything in uh, Western art history. And they always think it's the rectangle that's important. Well, it's not the rectangle. It's the fact, it's the scale. The, the scale has, has all of these attributes that other proportions don't have. But they're not in the rectangle, they're in the proportional scale, the logarithmic scale. Mm. So uh, anyhow, you can do projects of infinite complexity and, um, and, har and they stay very harmonious. It's very difficult. It'd be very difficult to come, come up with a different proportional system that would work better. I don't think it's possible to tell you the truth, except for maybe um, the charm of the uh, polygons themselves, which I also used in the architectural design. In the Middle Ages, they substituted the polygons um, for the uh, <clears throat> ancient Greek logarithmic proportion, fractal, which were kind of a fractal mode. And uh, that gives the, you know, kind of the Byzantine and Middle Ages its own special flavor. So again, going back to perspective and so forth and illusion, um, again, these different skills um, skill sets combined to create illusions. Here's, this was a project they did for a stairwell in Santa Barbara where the roof was flat. They wanted to see a cupola roof on it, which they couldn't build because of height restrictions. And so I painted it to look like a cupola from one point of view. And if you look oh, from, right. that, say from another point of view, that's how it's actually painted. Um, also, an interesting thing was in theory, when you learn classical drawing, you can also sculpt. It comes for free. And it turns out uh, I had the chance to test it out. I got a big sculptural commission. And I was able to find out whether my drawing skills translated into sculpture, which is kind of ironic because you start with sculpture, learn drawing, and then you use your drawing to go back to doing sculpture. And it turns out that uh, it works. So the same kind of classical forms and design um, that you use in the drawing can be, you can, they come, they come to you when you take up um, a sculptural tools and start to model as well. So is adding that extra dimension make it all that more complicated or are the tools that no, you decipher no, making just, it so simple? The are the same, yeah, you know, it doesn't really change anything. The, the, the fact is that you're using more um, dimensional shapes rather than two dimensional shapes. You tend to obviously use more three dimensional shapes, but the whole straight against round thing soft against hard, um, long against short, that all holds up. And, and it doesn't take very long before you, you feel it in your hand, even if you're working in three dimensions. Hmm. So anyhow, all of this stuff has brought me through all sorts of different projects. But I think uh, this is a museum I did of 3D works in Mexico. <laughs> different, some different uh, rooms. So it was uh, 21,000 square feet. So I had plenty of room to do stuff. Plenty of room, yeah. And this is a design for a uh, three-dimensional anamorphic piece where the roof is flat and columns are columns and then the floor is flat. Uh, but this, this inspired me to um, do another kind of piece where I did, there's a very famous thing called an Ames room where the room is distorted and a figure, one figure appears bigger than the other. But it's, it's distorted. Uh, to, if you think of a cube, you have one set of of one face that's distorted, whereas I did one with everything distorted, all the, the two faces distorted, the verticals remain vertical. And so I made my own room using this. So here's a picture of the room, how it, how it actually is built. And then this is how it looks through the lens, same room. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. But when uh, two people pose in it, of course, one appears much bigger than the other, like the intro. <laughs> But it's going off in uh, different really? dimensions. Huh. 
So um, again, I, I've, I've enjoyed teaching over the years. As you said, as you pointed out, I, I taught over 100,000 grade school students. I made a program which toured through California and other states. And uh, lately, I've been thinking to teach more online uh, some of these different ideas and skills. It's kind of comprehensive now, so it would be exciting to put some courses together to teach classical drawing, teach perspective, teach illusion, and uh, color theory, and so forth, all the different aspects Absolutely. of art. I've uh, systematically, <laughs> I've systematically gone a different direction than anybody else, I think. Uh, so, yeah. uh, this is a little drawing board I invented uh, to be able to teach online. I just did this recently. Uh, on the left is a, one of the many illustrations that people can just simply place on the drawing board. You can cut them out of the book or get PDF or whatever and place it on the board. Then there's a viewer. This is my prototype, so it's a little rough, but you have a viewer and you see that um, the viewer is actually, actually just a drawing board. So this, the si this size would be um, uh, like uh, 16 by 20 or something like that. It's not a big size, but people can put the plate on. And then they can put their phone on the um, little viewer. It's made to hold an iPhone. And then through the iPhone, you can see the effect. And then you can also draw uh, while you're looking through your iPhone. Wow. So you get so, to have real life experience yeah. so, and you're yeah. testing things out. OK. Wow. So more recently, um, or over the last years, last decade, I've um, done also collaborative pieces because street paint, the three-dimensional pavement art has become this enormous global uh, phenomenon. And uh, in Florida, once a year, or until COVID, we had uh, this festival where we did enormous pieces and I was able to work with um, probably more than half of the world's premier pavement artists in order to do um, huge and complicated designs, often involving more than plane. So first one, this was one only on the ground, but rather this was a world record at the moment. It was done, keeps oh, being broken. Um, Bacchus and the Wine Fountain. And um, the last one we did was here, the Megalodon Shark Lost World, which has, a, if I showed you the piece, it has the top part, the vertical parts are a, a panorama actually. So they're done on a, a curved panel, which is mounted on top of a scaffolding. And then the shot goes through the curved panel down to oh. the ground where all the people have done this enormous um, piece on the ground. And so you mm. get this kind of affinity sensation yeah. in that shot. <laughs> you just keep pushing and pushing the envelope, don't you? Yeah. So that was it. <laughs> oh, that's. Oh, my goodness. Let me just yeah. say, yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me just say, oh, wow. Oh, my I'm goodness. A, I don't even, I'm speechless. Well, the hardest part of doing the presentation was editing it because it's so much material. Oh, my. So, um, so a couple of questions. So you are able, I mean, one wonders, your, your art, your output is so prolific. You work so fast. You, you push it into this incredible 3D that looks so realism, uh, so real. Is it because you are versed in perspective, because you taught yourself perspective, you went into the intricacies and, and looked at this whole broad picture, you grappled with the tools, and now it's just second nature, so you're able to just go in and create? Um, and did the Renaissance masters have this depth of understanding? Was that part of how they were so gifted? to produce what they did because of this deep understanding from the inside out of these tools. Is that well, why the yeah. artists yeah. in art school this, today, they can't recreate this or go anywhere well, near it? Several questions. Yeah, when, when you invent something, you obviously have to understand it, you know, in a, the most profound way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they had to invent it and then they had to, um, they had to sell it, <laughs> you know, they had to, change the cultural perception so people could actually read the images. It wasn't automatic for people to read the images. So they had a relationship with perspective, which was completely different than what we would learn today. And in many ways, it was stronger. And in, in many ways, a lot of what I did was I went back and tried to, well, did kind of experience the invention. I, I relived the invention of it. And then, and the frustration of inventing it, where they had these things like the ellipse distortions, the sphere distortions, that they were not able to understand. 
And so to go back and say, wait a minute, here's something that these pers this person was this, you know, absolutely amazing people. They, they invented this thing and these were the problems that they weren't able to solve. Now Euclid too, axioms, um, um, postulates, stuff he doesn't understand. That's why they're axioms. He doesn't know why. He just but, knows that they are. Yeah, so he makes up the axioms and the postulates. And, you know, I think it, to his credit, those were placeholders. He's like, well, so, you know, a couple of years, somebody's going to come up, we're going to figure out what this means. But nobody did. Because layer after layer gets built on top of these axioms. And, you know, nobody wants to go back and say, well, you know, what do these things mean? What are they trying to say? Nobody's daring so, enough to overturn. Two thousand years go by. Yeah, two thousand years go by, and you can and you, and you know and the history of proportion is to is to cry over when you could look at the frustrations of artists over you know three or four hundred years trying to figure out great proportion, mm. arguing about it, debating it, and being frustrated and not knowing what the Greeks did. And they write that they didn't know it. They write that they didn't understand it. They write that it wasn't possible to understand. They wrote that the gods inspired the Greeks and that's all there was to it. I mean, you know, and, and, um, and uh, you know, the French government commissioned people to go to Greece and measure things and try to come up with, everybody really wanted to know because it's not only in the architecture, but in the bases and the pottery and everything you see these proportions all over. Beautiful, sophisticated proportions, you know, don't, don't miss a beat over and over and over and over again. And people just drove people crazy. What they ended up doing was just, just jotting them down, making sketches, and then copying, using those proportions in their own work, changing the elements, and just reusing their proportions. Mm. Well, you can see when a Roman artist copied a Greek sculpture, it wasn't the same. You can tell. No, it wasn't quite the same, was no, it? Not no. the same. So is the fact that your art, that your, look at the 3D-ness alone, the fact that these things jump out of a 2D and look so three-dimensional, is the fact that your art works proof of your theories. Yeah, that's what is, that's actually, I would say that's the function of my art. Mm. Yeah, major exactly. function of my art is to prove yeah. the idea. Because, because you couldn't do what you do without this understanding. Well, I, have, I, have be... no, I have no way, I have no way to enter academia and make any impact. So the only thing I can do is do proof of concept in terms of works. That's all. It's the proof you know. of concept. I oh, can't. Yes, I okay. can't go to the academia and say, "Look, this is how this is how classical drawing works. This is what this is what it yields. You know, this is you know this is why you attain mastery using this language as opposed to drawing from the right side of the brain, where you have no chance in hell of attaining mastery ever, ever, no matter how many hours you spend." Betty had I mean, to do us all a favor, truth. but it wasn't doing what you're doing. This so, is the truth. Is, but drawing from the right side of the brain is still the most sold drawing book. Mm. And it prevents people from mastering drawing. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, okay. So you st how many years have you been at this from the, from the 70s, the mid 70s to today? It took you what you said, you've developed this over time, but you were yeah. producing beautiful Renaissance quality art very early on. So yeah. my question maybe is, 22, 23. maybe not the perspective, yeah. maybe you weren't playing with the perspective to get the 3D effect right. until later, but early on, you were mastering the proportion, the light, the curve, the line. So, 82, to 84, 82 to 84, I heard that language, yeah. Yeah. So my question is, so the Renaissance masters, I mean, you'd have a varying degree of, of skill set of knowledge, of depth of knowledge, but you could produce at least two-dimensional drawings based on what they did early. And then well, you yeah, added more, I mean, then you added more, then you added the 3D. About it, I was also at a, at a disadvantage because I went to art yeah. school. I was told at the age of 19 that I'd never be able to draw the human figure. You you did it even before entering art school. You were playing with it. With well, I was playing with it, but I, no, when I entered art school, I was told at the age of 19, my drawings were so bad that I distinguished myself in drawing class and was told I would never be able to draw the human figure. By 22, I had, you know, I did the drawings that you saw in, in Rome. Wow. So you're talking about, um, you know, not that many years now. Had I had I done my exercise and I had done it in the proper order, starting at the age of thirteen, I would have probably been massively proficient by the age of twenty. I'm very, I think for, very proficient. 
I was going to say, for those of us that don't have that history and that educational aspect of what's going on, just being able to understand the mathematics behind it, the geometry. And yeah. today we throw around this word, it's become very popular to the word sacred in front of things, whether you talk about sacred yeah. ecology or sacred mathematics, or sacred uh, geometry. Sacred proportions. Sacred proportions. But this, well, you know, what you, you're doing, Curtis, you're bringing something home here. Go ahead. It's, it's an absolutely appropriate term. It's technically an appropriate term, sacred geometry, because um, uh, I think it was maybe Krishnamurti, but it, it's been said by very, you know, very good human beings that what is sacred, that which is sacred is that which is eternal. Mm. So sacred geometry is sacred because it, the symbolic language of geometry is describing metaphysical properties. And if you think about it, all of science and all of math ultimately is based on uh, Euclidean geometry. Mm. Numbers have no meaning independent of geometry. A number is a proportion. There's no such thing as the number three. Number three is three to one. It's relative, yeah. Because if you don't have one, you don't have a three. You can't have a three without a one. But we get, to, we get tired of saying, oh, four to one, three to one, five to one. No, we would say one, three, and five. But those are all proportions. Yeah. So, so number and an equation, as we've said before, an equation, um, when there was a Bertrand Russell, a great mathematician, who I think pretty much screwed up on his, his, his huge book he wrote trying to prove one plus one equals two because he hadn't reduced his equation. He needed to have one equals x plus x because one is unity equals is you know um equilibrium and then the other part of the equation is proportion and the fact of the equation is duality so you're rewriting the very definitions the very understandings of the elements here well, in yes, order to speak this much. new language but then if you do that then it goes into the rest of mathematics which is also based on axioms at the moment, you know, why should mathematics be based on axioms? It's, it's trying, and that's why you have sacred geometry because sacred geometry is the intuitive recognition that geometry, geometrical diagrams express metaphysical principles, the vital metaphysical principles which allow for the existence, which allow for creation, all creation. Well, we're, and we're getting back to nature herself, which was the whole point that they're decoding the physical universe and, and giving it expression as a language. But nature uses sacred geometry. Nature builds, nature grows. But you see, it doesn't really the use, series it doesn't really use geometry. It uses the creative principles. Um, okay, back to languaging. But ge geometry is a, is, a, is a language of symbols that express the creative principles, but what nature is using is the creative principles. Yeah. Doesn't and, need and just the proportion of our hand, you know, the the sacred proportions of the Fibonacci right. the spiral of equation. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but, uh, we're built of that sacred proportion. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's na nature, all pattern. This includes atomic pattern, molecular pattern, all pattern, far as I can tell, is based on um, is based on these five uh, five principles, and if you think about it, um, what we call what physics calls simple tools, which is every tool that could possibly exist in the universe, is a conglomeration of these simple tools like a lever, or a pulley, or and what are, what are those all those tools? A screw. What are they doing? They're trans. They're 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 proportions between translation and rotation. Mm. You know. So had Euclid got it right way back, go back 2,000 years, had the Greeks put this into whoever understood this best, written it out, and we lost a lot of their writings, we lost a lot of their work. So, and would science be fundamentally different today? Had we, would mathematics, yeah. would music, would art be fundamentally different it today? Be, our, understand, our, our understanding of it would be different, and then there's a lot of details that would be different, yeah. But our understanding of it would be different as well, very different. Um, for instance, there's no real difference between science and art. They're both expressing the same principles. There sh shouldn't be sacred geometry and geometry. There's only geometry. 
It should be all one. Should be all one. Yeah. Well, you played around with proportion to make your crazy room to illustrate where where you stood made that difference. So you can play with it. I mean. Yeah. Well, no. Every it's it's, it's infinitely creative. I mean, no doubt yeah. about it. I guess we have to use we have to use the word sacred to add the soul back to what rather than it being soulless research. Like the ultimate creator, this is how he creates. This is yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you put this you put the word in, but then on the other hand, the the purpose of the diagram is to evoke the creative principles, whereas the purpose of of mathematics is generally to solve a problem. When you get, if you get algebra or mathematics, um, what it becomes is it's applied mathematics, applied geometry, applied. And, and so what mathematics is, is, is really an app. It's the first app. <laughs> so when you talk about, you know, the Egyptians measuring the fields and all this stuff, using geometry, talk about, you know, the numbers and Fibonacci and this and that. Um, equations, I think, don't have any meaning in and of themselves. They're only an app which allows you to describe something in a perfectly predictable way. So for instance, if you have one orange plus one orange equals two oranges, but one plus one doesn't equal two, you need the oranges. Um, You know the Antikythera mechanism that they found at the bottom of the ocean and it looked like, oh, here's an astrolabe, here's something to describe the motions of the, the planets. We can't really decode it. Well, that was that perhaps based on this better understanding that's once reigned among the artists and who knows who else of Greece. And would we have a unified field theory that we could actually approach? I mean, what some people say base 12 makes more sense as a mathematical system because mm-hmm. it's divisible by one, six, three, four, um, all of that rather than base 10. Um, so, I mean, what, would that have been a better way for the whole foundation of modern civilization had we just tweaked it over here? Um, because so many people are calling for the fact that we don't have the right equation at the foundation no. of our understanding. I, There's a yeah, lot missing. Well, I hadn't heard yeah, I don't that. have those answers, <laughs> but I can tell you one thing. We can pose the questions. That if we don't understand what mathematics symbolizes what it's trying to say yeah. we're missing out on a lot <laughs> and i know that whenever i approach it like even approach making this one talk um this one presentation i invented like five things just putting it together mm. because every time i go into these topics new i get new ideas and new things become invented new insights yeah. yeah it's just it's just it's just like it's like this creative powerhouse. Yeah. Um, so, so, and you know, for me, it's it's kind of therapeutic in a way. It's kind of a meditation because what I, what, you, what I was doing is I started out with the most complicated problems of art, you know, which is you know figure drawing and perspective and color theory, and I just and proportion. I mean, these are mostly rather unsolved, and 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 they're all in crisis. I mean, these are horrible problems, all of them, and just went back to the very beginning, just went backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards. And I got back to the very beginning of each of these problems discreetly. And then it was like, oh, still missing something. I still haven't simplified it enough. So I just went backwards and backwards and backwards again. And I found that where they all meet is at the very beginning. So which which was these five uh, these five principles. That's that's where everything joins. And so if you if you branch out from the principles, then you are going to get a better um, you're going to get a better description of what's going on. Also, it, start, it starts to open up brand new ways of speaking about things, opens up brand new ways to speak mm-hmm. about consciousness, for instance, because people wonder, well, why does the human brain even understand reality? You know, the physical universe, when you go to study it, is often very, very dissimilar to our impression of it. Right. Why is that so? And yet, how can we possibly understand the physical? How can we even see anything or hear anything or organ- organize our perceptions at all? And the reason is that, that nature is using these same five creative principles. And our brain, I think, our consciousness is creating a structure internally, or it is, it is 
um, assimilating a pre-existing universal structure outside of us. I think both could be true or they're both simultaneously true because oh, we're not talking about I like that. You're speaking our language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so basically what happens is you have you have the universe you can describe two ways. One is you can describe it more, maybe more, but at least two ways. One is the physical universe, which science is obsessed about describing the physical universe. Then you can describe the formal universe. That is the universe of proportion, equilibrium, metaphysics, the metaphysical universe. Anything that exists in the universe can be described physically and metaphysically. Mm. So the structure of of consciousness and thought is a is a metaphysical formal structure which mimics exactly the physical universe uh, because they both use the same creative principles so that's how we have communication yeah and so the other the only other question is you know is 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 the conscious universe a pre-existing thing and do we just do we just kind of absorb more of it you know through our meditation or through our studies or, when or we, we open up the absorbing band. more and more of it yeah mm -hmm. um so you know from our little individual point of view are we just expanding into it um or are we are we creating um are we creating the metaphysical universe um my feeling is that having you know billions of people creating their own metaphysical universes uh which happen to be able to communicate with each other it's is unlikely. complex yeah <laughs> it's probably it's probably like we're all fish in water you know and the water is is already there the, field of, the fish, field of consciousness yeah, that's my perspective. So a lot of it is our worldview and getting outside temporarily the limits of our own uh, sensory apparatus. And you yeah. talked about the fish eye, you talked about the structure of the eye being curved. And I will say that was one lesson that I learned early on in college, standing on an overseas program in Greece, I didn't go to, but standing in front of a Greek temple. And they're telling you that hey these aren't exactly equidistant these columns they no. actually fudged them because they understood and took into account the yeah. perspective of but the eye fudged. and when you stand fudged. here they fudged it, it for look proportional so they actually not adapted either. that they understood that they yeah. compensated for the eye. you know it's, it's one thing to yeah. move a column it's another thing that the entablature actually grows and gets bigger as it goes away mm. yeah yeah I mean, that has to be sculpted. That means that you're adjusting your template. With exactly. that entablature. You're carving all of that egg and dart, all of those dentels, a little bit bigger as you move along uh, on these huge blocks of stone. It's just, oh, it's unbelievable. So it shows and, you the sophistication of their knowledge base in order to make those adjustments. Yeah. And it shows you a level Built of commitment. In. Yeah. I'm going to invite uh, invite some questions and comments uh, at this point, Kurt. And uh, first, I was going to start with Tony. Tony has his well, hand up. I just want to say stunning presentation. Right. So right. interesting to see inside the mechanics of it and to see through your eyes how you do what you do. Yeah. And you made it so clear with all your illustrations. Right. And what a brilliant career. Yeah, definitely, so. definitely a PhD program in art art history and yeah. perspective and geometry yeah. but I, I do before you go tony i just have to say one thing okay. um you kurt you won a kennedy center medallion for recognition and outstanding contribution to arts education you have taught and, and taught given classes to over a hundred thousand students you didn't teach them all this um but i just was curious how much did you <laughs> well, teach mostly them? Grade school, so it's just like, yeah. exactly so what you know That's I can just to, we, were, just... we, were, we, were, we were chalking and, and um, you know, they, nobody had any money. So uh, the pavement art turned out to be a perfect, um, the lo lowest possible cost visual arts program anybody could possibly do where, you know, a school of 1,200 students could all watch me, you know, draw and demonstrate for them and then go out and uh, try to use the three or four techniques that I gave them. Absolutely wow. impressive. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Tony, you can turn on your mic. Bring it home. Yeah. Okay, I think I have it. Uh, or I have to say, you said, may, may I say something first? Stunning presentation. 
That was exactly the words I was planning to use. So, Curtis, <laughs> uh, so I, I think we get into some kind of synchrony here. Uh, well, as, as a left brain person, uh, I, I'm totally fascinated by this a left brain person who tries to do art. And uh, my first question for you, you talked about your drawing board and it sounds like there's an instructional book that you have. And, yeah. I, and I must get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going, I am, I've been um, hoping to branch out on uh, instructional videos and instructional programs, but I kind of take it seriously. So um, I'm working on it and I'm hoping within the next month or two to start uh, launching um, YouTube videos, just introducing the ideas, kind of yeah. like we did here. Well, I can later on, like, I'll delve into each of them because each of them, like, for instance, color theory and color use, color mixing, you know, is a huge topic. It's a whole course, you know, just that yeah. one. Well, I, I definitely want to subscribe. I, so please uh, let, let right. us know how to do that. This is great. I'll send a message yeah. out. And okay. Tony, and I, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Paul. Oh, I was just going to say, as an astrophysicist, having this connection between the world of mathematics and art, and I thought Kurt's done such an incredible job of connecting the worlds, it must be a real pleasure for you to be able to, to, to uh, participate today in, in a this. former NASA artist. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I have, a, I have actually a great NASA story. Okay, let's um, hear I had, this, yeah. I had this funny, funky studio in the old wind tunnel building at JPL, so it was this defunct wind tunnel. Uh, they ran twice a month to, to keep it running because it was too expensive to take it apart. And so my, my painting studio was in there, and my best client was the solar probe uh, project leader who um, was designing spacecraft to go to the sun. And that, we're talking 40 years ago. So eventually, you know, the, these things flew, other countries flew them mostly. But um, so he came, I remember him coming in one day with his lead physicist, and they're looking at me, and I'm, I'm doing a landscape, a, a, a sunscape with my airbrush, painting this thing out. And then he's, and he's looking at me, and he's just, like kind of wistful and he says, boy, I would just love to be creative. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, I'm playing with paint and this man's designing a spacecraft to go to the sun. <laughs> He's calling me creative. There's, there's some way in which we're not using this word correctly. Just connect. <laughs> I read that story in your book, Asphalt Renaissance. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I, I have to tell you, I, I, I was at JPL for a number of years, so I know the culture there and, 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 and how marvelous uh, it was. Well, I, I do have a, another sort of technical question. I, I loved your illustration and, and breakdown of the Parthenon, and I was following this pretty closely through the fifth square, but the sixth square started to get a, a little bit more tenuous in interpretation to me. I wonder if there's a point when, when this uh, breaks down uh, where, where, where the architect and the artist no longer follow the progression. No, I don't think it breaks down, but it gets it gets um, adjusted for optics. We were talking about that with the spacing of the columns and the right. And, uh, oh, okay, yeah. that makes sense. So that could uh, could uh, makes another element of complexity in the ter determination. It, it does, and it doesn't. It's amazing how these things in general follow this very very closely. Now, there's two things that happen. One is, one is, uh, they just can't achieve that. They just can't, achieve, you know, it's, it's a, when you try to do one, if you try to make a composition using this, it's not, it, it's very useful and it's very beautiful, but it's hard too, because, you know, you don't always have the little measurement you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you've used it once or, you know, and so especially when you get down into the smaller measurements, you get the idea that, um, they, they'll also start to repeat them now and again. You know, by the time you get to number eight or ten, you'll see that they'll start to repeat the same um, the same measurement a couple of times. Now, maybe if you went in with a microscope, or you did what I did, which was take a detail of the, of the Parthenon, you take a detail and you find find that that still breaks up. Which means if you had your original scale where you're starting from the entire height of the building and going down from there. And then you're down into these details, which are like the size of your thumb, and you're still on the same scale. I mean, that's just kind of, uh, it's amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Well, even, even with a photograph, uh, you do get what's called distortion. So mm, yeah. you, do not, you do not necessarily have an exact geometric uh, reproduction. Well, I figured out also there's intasis of columns, and I, I did figure out what that's about, and there is a way to model it physically. Uh, yes, there is. And, and we do that, but yes. Well, even your own exactly. eye is a distortion. Even your eye is a curve. So you're always seeing through yeah, curves. Absolutely. Right? 
Uh -huh. yeah. and, and you know what they did was, was actually for Intasis, they um, stood at one point, and I've done this myself, and I finally said, there must be, uh, there must be a, me a mechanism for this. So I, I, think I found that if I, if I took a stick um, about, let's say, eight inches or so, 12 inches, that if I stood at centered myself on the Parthenon and I stood at a certain distance, which they have oddly uh, a metal disc pounded into the granite. I stood on that disc and I found that if I took the stick and held it out arm's length horizontally and then cut it to the point where it, it was exactly a distance between two columns and then I, I, I rotate this, I look through and I rotate my arm well, so the stick goes up and down. I'm present. I that the, the ends of that stick follow the columns, and so what that means is that the columns, uh, the distance, the space between the columns, they weren't really, they weren't really uh, correcting the columns. They were correcting the spaces between the columns, and um, and that's a hyperbolic distortion. It turns out. How fascinating! I love it. <laughs> but they could have done it optically by just standing there, yeah. um, and then and correcting it as they yeah. went up. I want so to say it was a totally here, possible thing to do. Hmm? I want to say here that you'd be interested in Tony's work with Nomons, G-N-O-M-O-Ns, and how Asian people took sticks, put them in the ground, um, uh -huh. and traced, Tony, do you want to <clears throat> jump in here, and traced the sun on the equinox right. or the solstice and the shadow line that it would draw, a straight line on the equinox and a curved parabolic line on well, the two solstices. So using using our curved rotation around um no um well, well here, here's the thing here's here's another thing um common knowledge um does does the does the um sun rotate around the earth or does the earth rotate around the sun what's the correct answer well let's see <laughs> so it's it's not really nothing stationary both of them are moving well, there's, through space there's, there's a better time. answer though i think yeah. better answer is both both yeah because there's a model for each one yeah um, the, the problem is that if you if you take the sun the sun rotating around the earth it's making this helix going back and forth which goes back and forth and so what happens though is you say, okay, well, the sun's making this helix as it rotates around the earth. And some person is sitting on the ground on a perfectly flat piece of ground, which they may have made by on a beach or something, or, or they've, they've planed something by, you know, letting water out of a tub or something. So they have, a, they have a flat surface. Now, effectively, that surface is flat. So effectively, for them, the earth is flat. Uh, it's immeasurably curved. And then the sun, effectively, for them, is rotating around the earth. So that rotation then, if you take a stick and you, and you mark its no, it's no monitor shadows, um, what are you gonna get? Well, you're gonna get hyperbola because the, um, because the path, the, the circular path of the sun, which is slowly making a helix, but day to day it's mostly circular, is going through this, let's say through the eye of the stick if you had a needle or something. And then it's projecting onto the flat surface that you've prepared. And as that does it, that flat surface becomes a conic section of the movement of the sun. And a conic section at that angle is, of course, a hyperbola. Yes. But Kurt, I have to tell you, there is a singularity at the equinox. On yeah. the equinox and only the equinox, the line is exactly straight. And the line also is exactly, yeah, exactly east-west. And even a few hours of deviation from the moment of equinox can begin to form curvature. And Paul constructed a lovely gnomon at, at Kayamunge, which uh, where we've been able to, to participate in it. It's really fun. Yeah, yeah. per Tony's yeah, instructions. Those are great, those are great things. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. also, but it shows you how in, you know, when we teach science often we get, you know, I just, I get unhappy with how we teach science and math because, um, for instance, if somebody just says something simple like, I believe in science, well, that's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You know? yes, it is. I mean, people say it all the time, and it just makes me cringe. It's, science isn't meant to be believed in. It's, 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 oh, it's, <laughs> science, yeah. science is a worry. It's, it's yeah. the yeah, Yes. You know, and it has become a religion for some. You know, 
Yeah. Problem is the sentence is more complicated. You could say, I have faith in the scientific approach to solving our problem. So that's fine. You know that, but I believe in science is just not right because it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's supposed to be real. Science. That's its nature. Uh, well, well, thank, thank you, you, Tony. You. Uh, and thank, thank Tony you. is a scientist and a mystic combined. So. Well, that's why he's here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's a great series and, and Kurt, thank you so much. And oh, I great. definitely want to participate. I definitely want your next book. I just ordered ordered your sidewalk book. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep working on all this, but th yeah. thank you so much. So, um, so is it sacred because nature figures it out? Nature can only use what truly works. Nature in her infinite experimentation with life and the forms of life and you, I agree with you nature is my favorite artist as well and your second and um, so nature uses what works and so we look at nature and it I mean fractals are beautiful fractals we we seek yeah. out we get into a trance zone looking at, at bar, fractals bar, um, to I look would, at uh, nature is I it would, would, deemed I, sacred I would, and beautiful because we're so ahead, used to seeing ahead. it in nature herself yeah, I would propose something more profound than that. Okay. I would say it's sacred because it it exists eternally and previous to the creation of the universe. Okay. That the void. We're, right we're, out talking, of Plato. we're talking about basically. If you were a Buddhist, you would say that we're talking about when you talk about the five creative principles. They're all they're all attributes of the void. They exist, they already exist in the nothing, in the void. They're, they're, kind of, they're kind of like the void has these attributes. And so when you talk about starting with a point and making this drawing and coming up with these five immediately, by, way, by the way, I mean, to me, the interesting things about like when I was studying proportion or color is that what I want to see is that the solution comes out in an immediate and inevitable way. Okay. So you can't really imagine a universe where there's an alternative way to create anything without you're looking the at the bedrock line. you're looking yeah. at the so you're looking at something that and and so you'd have to say that it didn't the principles didn't in, get invented by nature nature reflects the principles oh, I like so that. when you look at something in nature and say my gosh that's gorgeous where does that aesthetic come from? Well, it could come from experience because, you know, we, we just, we have good, we have associations. But at a certain point, it, it comes from, um, at a certain point, we look at seashell and we find it beautiful. It's an, I think it's an empathetic reaction. I think, I think our relationship to beauty is one of empathy. Hmm. We find things beautiful that we have things that, that have something in common. We with can us. relate. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what do they have in common? What does a seashell have in common with us? Well, it has the creative principles in common. It has proportion. It has, um, it has all these, these different balances of these creative principles. And so, so my feeling is that all of aesthetics, um, well, aesthetics has, there's, there's two things about aesthetics. One is either it's based on our past experience, our aesthetics you know, can be partially based on our past experience, but they can also be based on these on these universal eternal truths, and the universal eternal truths I think uh, go back to these these creative principles. Mm. And I so think it exists before the Big Bang. Let's say there are there are yeah. they're 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 there in the field of all potentiality and in the. So is this what Plato was getting at then with his Platonic solids and yes, data exactly is what looking it's at exactly you know, what he's getting. So and this was... Archimedes also wrote that, you know, because we talk about a point and a line and a shape, some people think there are real things of this sort. And then Plato ran into the trouble because he, he started to invent this parallel universe with all of these perfect forms in it. Uh, understanding that there was a problem in the, in the wh why can we imagine perfect forms if they don't exist in nature? I mean, nature has beautiful forms, but we... Oftentimes we look at nature and say that's really beautiful, but I could make a little, I could tweak it a little bit and make it better. So, so you come up with an ideal of proportion, which then at a certain point can actually surpass nature because it's not contingent on, on survival. It's not contingent on a lot of things that nature has to deal with. And um, so ideal, ideal, the ideal in art can actually um, create, you know, can actually make something that maybe is, is in some ways more beautiful than nature because it 
that's all it has to work with. It's all it has to perform, all it has, its only function. Uh, nature has to, has to balance whatever it creates with all sorts of, you know, hot and cold and, you know, drought and intent, you know, all, the, all these different things have to happen. It's amazing that nature creates anything beautiful at all. Um, it shows you, it shows you how the creative spirit of nature is, is it, one thing I really hate about evolution is this fight and flight survival scenario. I think it's so, it's so colonial. Um, <laughs> I think nature creates effusively and spontaneously. And evolution is kind of like the art director who limits uh, the creativity of nature. Oh, I love but that. I think, I think, yeah. I think evolution is, is pulling back on this opulence and this diffusion of creativity and saying, no, no, you're going to go there. That's just too, that's too baroque. Um, we, you know, and so basically what you get is nature proposing all of this Wonderful, and you see that when environments are benign, it really goes to town. Then you get your peacocks and your crazy birds and all this stuff. When when things are when nature, when the balance of ecosystem is benign, you get all this beauty, and things get really baroque. And then when 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 the ecosystem system is severe, then you tend to get this kind of ugliness and austerity in a certain way. Um, and that's where, to me, evolution is more like a, a hypercritical editor or art director, which mm -hmm. is um, limiting mm -hmm. the beauty of, of nature's production in order to make it viable within the uh, ecological system. Uh, but nature left to its own, if it had no limitations, would, would, would be very effusive and very, extremely beautiful. And that's right where we get back to this very ancient idea of being in right relationship with the universe, right relationship with our community and with ourselves. And that's what beauty is. That's how the ancients define beauty, being in right relation. Because then everything flows and everything works beautifully. And you don't have the vagaries of, of uh, various factors impinging and... Well, think of, think of all the of art that'd be in the world. Think of all the art that'd be in the world if there wasn't war, think of what cities would look like. Uh, I, I and mean, what would have survived? It, yeah. Yeah, it would, it would just be what, you know, at a certain point competition, I, I, I guess, you know, does create certain quality of things. But, you know, you also have to say, well, if you didn't have all of the strife and, and uh, destruction and people worked on communal projects rather than all running around trying to get their own thing done. We made done, living re instead of weaponry. Um, that, yeah. yeah. Probably you'd end up, you know, you know, why, why didn't we stop building really beautiful cathedrals? You know, you know what couldn't we? I mean, maybe they don't have to be cathedrals, but, but we, don't, we don't build very many public works of great beauty, um, considering that presumably we're the richest um, country ever in the history of the world. Our output, our artistic output is, is you know, it's not completely to be thrown out, but it's far less than one would expect you know considering best. what ancient Greece did you know or or, or the Renaissance or, or other culture you know I think our best export remains music but we can't compare that to the ancients because we don't really hear their music and in terms of their records um, and how much <laughs> was passed down da Vinci wrote a lot he left volumes and we have many of them did you ever see hints of this knowledge base in Vinci. No, no. I mean, I, I did look for it, obviously. In, in, um, I did look for it, and um, Bill has one of his books. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even in the history perspective, da, da Vinci is one of these guys who gets a little. He get it, it's it's like Tuscany, you know. It's like uh, they take credit for things which aren't Tuscan. It's, you know, they didn't invent pasta and they didn't invent the opera and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, it, it, he's kind of like people assign him a lot of um uh, of things which other artists actually did uh, so mm. uh. It's, it's a little and he and he was a little bit um you know he he kind of joined up with pacioli to write uh that thing to illustrate that famous book uh, divina proporzione uh, and they basically stole piero della francesca's work you know so ah. You know, welcome to the wholesale stolen. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was already, 
Ray Capaccioli over the coals well, for this. Also, but. they were part of a guild. I mean, guilds did not tend to hand out their secrets. You had to kind of be a member and then be initiated to learn the secrets. So, well, Pilato Francesca actually wrote wrote the book and meant to publish it. So it wasn't the secret, but uh, he was too sick and wasn't able to do it. And then he just got his work kind of stolen, took credit for it, kind of thing. Well, uh, at least so it wasn't that it was meant to be a secret. It was just that they, they stole it. And in current, and then you know, the Last Supper, for instance, is is very obviously it's one of those things everybody looks at in terms of perspective. But um, in my own studies, I find that the Last Supper actually is not. Is not in perspective. It's not, and in one point, perspective was well known when Da Vinci did that composition, and um, he didn't use it. Um, he he was trying. He had, I think, pretty brilliant idea for a different kind of perspective, um, but it didn't pan out. It was it ran in, ran into a snag, and. Um, and so there, he put a bunch of mystery around it, and um, and this kind of mystery, this veil of this kind of Dan Brownish um, ambiance he set around it, um, influenced a lot of artists and gave him a lot of kudos for inventing more perspective than he actually did. He, um, what he was trying to do was find a, a relationship for, between proportion and perspective, and it. it didn't pan out. I mean, it, it does exist, but it didn't pan out. Um, uh, it just was, wasn't as useful, or exciting as he thought it would be, I think. And uh, so, so basically, when you when you measure the piece, you find it's not actually in perspective, it's a, it doesn't have a consistent point of distance. And there's no, there's no theoretical place where somebody could stand and see it um, all in the right every every element in the same. Mm. What do you think of David Hockney and how he is saying that they had instruments to look through? They had this. Right. Uh, well, David Hockney made this enormous mistake. Uh, he's a very brilliant person and had a lot of good things to say, but he made this absolutely enormous mistake in the sense that he um, assumed that artists were more attached to uh, observation than they were. And you said at the beginning. It's he didn't, he didn't have any place in his book for invention. That is drawing from your imagination. Because a tool, you know, an instrument's not gonna help you draw from your imagination. 80% of the output of, of that, of the time periods he's talking about was from the imagination. So, you know, optical tools aren't really gonna be very helpful. You talked about muscle memory, that you became so adept, this became so much a, a part of you to understand how they were doing it once you mastered that tool, muscle memory. Can you describe that process more? And then I have one, one other question for you. <clears throat> well, if you can imagine a uh, contour where I'm saying you're going to go um, um, long curve, short straight, longer curve, short straight, even shorter curve, even shorter straight, very long curve. Okay, so sooner or later your hand is just doing this and you have an idea, you have this basic structure, this basic structure of shapes. So you, you start, you're starting off with a, a strong, good design just with the shapes. And then you're taking all of those anatomical details which are great, and you're dividing them out from that basic structure in this proportional way. And so, you stop really thinking in the sense that if you have a line of a certain length, you know the next one has to either be longer or shorter. Can't be the same. Now your hand, before you train yourself, is always going to try to make the second line the same length as the other one. Oh. But you have to stop that. You have to retrain yourself so that it's not doing that. And so sooner or later, you know that that's what you need to do, how you need to solve the problem. And you don't stop thinking about it and then it becomes automatic. So it becomes muscle memory. It's in your hand. And then when you draw to different scales, um, then you have to retrain yourself slightly, but it goes much faster. So if you're drawing a thumbnail, um, you'll, you know, there's different muscles you're using. But there's a certain point where the, the proportion ingrains itself. It is muscle memory, but it, it, it ingrains itself in the hand-eye coordination, and uh, you're able to express it on different scales as well. But when you think about it, when, I, when you look at the proportional logarithmic division of the Parthenon, it's the same scale, but it's going from 
the whole height of the thing down to this little tiny detail, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it's always the same relationship. It's always this to this. Which is part of what yeah. makes it useful. This to this, and then the smaller ones to this, the smaller ones to this. And so it's always going that same amount. And so that's what you're really training yourself to do. Now, artists didn't know, see, the thing is they didn't know they did it because they only had, they only were given the exercises. So they only sat in the, um, they sat there and they drew. And it just, and after a minute, you know, some were more able to assimilate it than others. Mm -hmm. But, um, to a certain extent, they all assimilated, partly because they drew from other people's drawings first before doing that exercise. Mm -hmm. So they already had the language. But if you can imagine yourself in a time, you're an artist, you're studying, you've never seen an image that wasn't created by an artist. Right, no photographs back then. Right, but think of the consequence. You've never seen an image of any kind that wasn't created by an artist. And they only had that kind of art or what came before, so their even their art. Yeah, so, so basically, it was either you use the language presentation or you can't draw. Got it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Last question. So you are describing nature and the principles of creativity as existing in a field before anything; that they're just there. You can take everything away. And we will still create, nature will create, nature's creating all over the universe with these same creative principles. Everything is yeah, aligned feeling, to these is, principles. My feeling is that if, if the universe imploded and we had a big bang, uh, the same principles would probably be operating. Right. So, um, so in the big controversy of is there a creator to this universe or is it just an accident of... Uh, so where where do you stand on that equation? Is there an intelligence to the universe? Is there something inherent where it itself was designed? Well, it's a very controversial what, yeah. subject, right? Here's what but, I, well, I know, and I don't really want to weigh in because I think I think when you talk about metaphysics, you can't use the language you use when you talk about physics. And I think almost all theological discussion gets caught up in this problem. So whether there is, you know, let's, let's imagine that, that you say, well, God is a personification of these creative principles, right? So the figure of God, as has been represented in history, is a personification of these principles, which are inherent in our universe. Reason. Now, the two, obviously the two, when you look at Genesis, you know, what is, what is God? He's the creator, right? So in a certain way, the creator can be a personification of creativity. Can also be not creator. <laughs> maybe there's actually, maybe there's a, a distinction without a difference there. Because all of this Renaissance art was celebrating that story, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So well, that depiction and that yeah. You know, to be but they honest, were adding their own layers. Yeah. Well, they modeled, they modeled the Christian God on Zeus during the Renaissance. So they modeled him on the gods. You know, Michelangelo's God on the Sistine ceiling is, is basically drawn from or characterized from statues of Zeus, which he drew from. That's how, that's how he... Now, my feeling is he and the church and everybody knew that these images were metaphorical. Yes. Yeah. We, looking back on it, assume they didn't. We, looking back on it, assume that, that Native peoples didn't understand that their images were metaphorical. Mm. That's an assumption we make. I think it's probably a pretty shabby assumption. I agree. All, and I think it's, it's shabby, it's a bad assumption when you talk about Native people, and it's a bad assumption when you talk about Renaissance artists. Okay. <clears throat> that we know I, aware think of. Were, I think they were fully aware that their graven images, quote unquote, which, you know, the Jewish faith uh, warned people against graven images. And I think they were fully aware that their graven images were, were metaphorical, um, that were, they were bringing the story home making it so that people could understand it you know so, so you know and i think native peoples too are aware that you know the god of rain is a metaphorical figure i mean some people are maybe not everybody i'm sure there's people who don't i mean just like now you know the 
every fundamentalist religion that you know take, takes things literally and that's what they're all about that's their thing but we um, know that it's art it's myth it's myth it's story it's theater it's symbol i do it's i, I do say it's, it's yeah. I, I do I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a piece right now for a catholic church so uh, a saint yeah saint jude <clears throat> And um, yeah, we don't know what Saint Jude looked like. He has an iconography. You go through the iconography, and then you figure out, you know, what the best way to depict Saint Jude is. And people have different opinions about that. So, but we, we, what you're trying to do is capture. You're trying to capture the attributes of the saint, the story, the importance of, you know, and, and you're trying to put that in an image. And of course, that's what you do. Um, and then, you know, I'm doing it. I'm aware I'm doing it. It's not like it's a big mystery to me. You know, I think everybody, any people, whoever sculpted the big, you know, ivory figure of Athena in the Parthenon, uh, they knew that they were doing. Well, you know, there was no big if fat you're mystery. If you art for the ages, then you're not caught up in quote realism. Then you're delivering an eternal message. You're delivering the subtext. You're delivering. Uh, qualities and attributes that you talked about that well yeah realism you know, realism, realism yeah. is a post photography concept exactly so and this wasn't yeah. yeah realism didn't exist until the photograph so so um, now we're talking about the great meaning of art and what it conveys we're talking about <laughs> all the arts and yeah it was all a and metaphor again, and story yeah the truths that we can tell ourselves that are eternal in 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 conclusion, Kurt, it's been interesting because, uh, you know, besides your your ability to teach, your research, all, your your incredible artistic skills, I mean, you're following and decoding, and decoding. decoding the decoding. Mm-hmm. You're leading a path as a mystic. I mean, you're opening up a doorway to information and knowledge, and uh, you know, don't know your personal journey internally and how you, you know, the the, the peacefulness. You, that you're at within yourself or whether this dry that you feel to decode it, to figure it all out, to make the connections. But um, it's, it's a, it's a powerful place to be. I mean, you know, you haven't cut off. For me, it's kind of a meditation. Yeah. Because um, there's very, there's a part of art. that's very much about, I mean, you talk about Maya, there's nothing more Maya than art. Mm. Art is is just all about Maya. Creativity is all about creativity and Maya are the same thing. So um, when you unravel the processes or the language of art and you go back down to the beginning of creation, you're peeling the layers of the onion back. And so in a certain way, mentally, you're removing Maya, which you, they're gonna put it back in. <laughs> but but at dance. least as, as, a, mm-hmm. as a metaphysical or spiritual or mental exercise. Mm. for removing all of these layers of Maya. And there's a lot of layers of Maya and a lot of reasons that we struggle with it, with, with figurative art in our time is that there's way too many layers of information that isn't uh, necessarily useful to a person. Like uh, anatomy books, you know, nobody had anatomy books till 1920. Anatomy books, the whole business of teaching anatomy as we know it today, um, was uh, a, an invention after the invention of photography where people started not being able to draw and that they felt that everybody needed to know anatomy and so that would that would serve that would save save it and well, those so renaissance started, masters were cutting over a few cadavers and studying them to get their anatomy. yeah but they did it as old men they'd already done all their work yeah mm. oh okay <laughs> Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Michelangelo sculpted the da- David Long before we ever, uh, you know, took apart a cadaver. Well, I mean, he took apart a cadaver. He was after the Sistine ceiling, and he, his figures were extremely stylized. What I love here is peeking under the hood, peeking under the meaning of things. And art is such a rich um, mm. subject, and it's an eternal language. We have art going back. To the beginning of our species, um, mm. nature is that artist. I agree with you, um, but to peek under the hood and just see the meaning, how it's conveyed, what is the language to re- become reacquainted with that language. Yeah. And, also, uh, what is all what the is, languages you know, to become multifaceted? Uh, go ahead. You know, and I also think you know what is language in, in, in visual art, what is language, and what is style. You know, and um, 
you know, where, where do you find the powerful elements of language and, and where do you um, get all caught up in, in some, maybe some style, stylistic problems that you don't really, uh, don't really serve you. Um, I think that's a big problem with figurative art and uh, because, you know, nowadays when you look at people doing figurative art or teaching figurative art, you know, they're responding to manga and graphic novels and all of these different things. In the United States today, you cannot get a bachelor's degree in figurative art as fine art. That's just not offered. They've nowhere took it off the curriculum. The entire country, not one single stupid university, not even a religious school, thought it was appropriate to offer figurative art as fine art, a fine art degree in figurative art. Nobody does it. Yeah. The entire country has decided that figurative art is not fine art. In flagrant ignorance of our entire history as human race, of, you know, absolutely unbelievable, unbelievable decision. Nobody even talks about it. So you're filling in that, you're filling in that gap, aren't you? Yeah. Well, how do you do it? I mean, when you go say, okay, well, I want to, I want to teach figurative art as fine art. How do I do that? You know what? You can't. You can't without doing a ton of research. Yeah. It's not possible. The material isn't there. It just yeah. isn't. You can't, as, you can't teach it as an academic subject. Because what? Why? Because uh, the only way to teach it is to make sure nobody ever sees the photograph and sits you know, five years in front of sculptures and great drawings and draws. Mm. You know, and, and that's not going to happen. So uh, it's it's not a teachable subject, and there's no intellectual um, there's no intellectual content. Which you know, if you're going to go to uh, university, they need to have their intellectual content. Now, uh, contemporary art has nothing but intellectual content. It's all full, you know, absolutely huge volumes of mm -hmm. you know wild, wild things. But um, <clears throat> it's rich. But you know, it's not right. It's not if you're a young person. And you go and you see a Thomas Moran, a Thomas Cole, a Bierstadt landscape, you see great still, Dutch still lifes, you see um, the Renaissance masterpieces, Bernini, and you say, wow, I think I could use some of this information to make art in my life, right? Mm -hmm. Too bad. And, you know, I mean, that's just, it's a brutal thing to say, but I'm totally right on this. Mm -hmm. Too bad for you, young man or young woman. Too bad for you. We don't offer it. Unless you study something radical like you did and left school and taught yourself. So yeah, well, you, you you go study illustration like everybody else. Well, guess what? Illustration doesn't give you those paintings. Yeah. So. Well. Well, again, an thanks. innovative career, finding your own contribution, finding your own path, uh, inventing along the way. And pushing mm -hmm. the seam of the envelope. So in your slide presentation, fabulous, fantastic, interesting, connecting the dots like no one else ever has for me, at least personally, and I'm probably for no one else either. <laughs> you, you're bringing forth a new way of understanding, and I, I, well, uh, I can I, say it's new stuff. I mean, yeah. I, I can't guarantee anything about that, but it's yeah. definitely new stuff. Okay. I haven't given you anything um, from the except for references, but I haven't given you any theory from a book. Ah. Thank well, you. and I appreciate uh, really the metaphysics of something as um, basic as geometry to really look under that hood. That was exciting too. So well, thank you. And the philosophy, you know, you're a philosopher as much as an artist. So um, I like to think of myself that way. <laughs> yeah. Nobody ever writes me a check for it though. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, welcome to our world. <laughs> and that's <laughs> the Renaissance masters is to see the philosophy behind it. Yeah. You know that there's you know, a that was thing. It was so important. That, that's one of the things that was so important in that time is they felt they were philosophers. And they were. And they were. And mm. they were. Yeah. Go back to it. Yeah. So thank you, Kurt Wenner. Um, oh, your book thank you is very much. Asphalt Renaissance. It's a wonderful read. I think you take students. Uh, my sister Kimberly has a friend who's going to be uh, spending, quitting his job, selling his business, spending two years. Uh, with you over there near a CC. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you'll be uh, continuing to teach and we'll see some online videos from you, kurtwinner.com. So, yeah, we look forward to more. And thank you well, for I'm setting up. I'm finishing my uh, studio. I've been working a couple of years on COVID.
hit me between the eyes. But yeah, I hope to have something out pretty soon. All right, Kurt. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, Thank you very much.